You know, um, I'm willing to forgive a lot of things when it when it comes to uh, science in a field that's fairly unstudied. Um, I'm willing to forgive bad sample sizes and somewhat sloppy methodology. What I'm not willing to forgive, and it's a grievous error that J. Michael Bailey commits in his um, book, The Man Who Would Be Queen. So, I mean, yeah, um, I don't know where to start with that title, but anyway, let, let's stop talking about the hater stuff and the, oh, he's a pervert and what have you, and, and let's just talk about the science for a second. So what he's done, he found a sample size of uh, a small amount of trans sex workers in, I believe it's the Orlando area. Um, and so, yes, uh, most are post-operative, some are pre-operative or non-operative. And I opened in a reply to him on an article that he wrote saying that he didn't think that the responses to him were genuine and accurate and that they ignored the science. But my question is, what science has J. Michael Bailey ignored? Uh, I wrote to him, let's see, uh, first of all, after mentioning some non-conforming uh, narratives, that there's a significant sampling bias in his work, and that by selecting for women who have transitioned successfully um, are able to find you know, work due to their physical desirability. So, uh, I, I, again, I wouldn't say particularly successful. I mean, sex work is for some fantastic and for some just survival. Um, I want to point out the fact that that selects for people that doctors have, uh, have an easier time imagining as women. So, if you fit the narrative, you know, if you like to wear short skirts and high heels and present very fam... I mean, let me put it this way. If I had a, a nice little ridge of bone hair, um, I probably would have waited longer than the five months I waited for spironolactone. I probably would have waited longer than the 11 months I waited for estrogen. You know, it's, it's lookism. I was lucky. Um, and that's kind of a hard thing to say, considering if I'd been cis and asked for the morning after pill, it'd have been two months after I got at a given birth by the time I got properly treated. Anyway, um, continuing on. You make an assumption that autogynephilia is the result of patterning without doing long-term or even short-term brain studies on those who could be considered transsexual under the DSM, that is, desire to be recognized as the opposite gender, to recognize oneself as the opposite gender to which one is uh, assigned but have made a strong decision not to transition or even identify as what they had already expressed as their target gender. And yes, there is a large population of these people. Um, they're first mentioned in a uh, book uh, that Brian Gilmartin wrote on Love Shy Men. Um, he called this particular population male lesbians. He said that they weren't trans because they didn't want to transition, but of course, as we've shown, there's a lot of people who want to transition who can't transition and thus convince themselves they don't want to transition. Um, and take that population and compare them to those who are transitioning or intend to transition or are disheartened at the perception that they can't transition or for that matter a control group of cis women and another control group of cis men. Because you want to see maybe, you know, if it's all about patterning and thinking of yourself as a woman turns you on that maybe you should think if cis women are turned on by thinking of themselves as women, because that does, you know, kind of happen. Um, he doesn't explain bisexual trans women, um, other than apparently they all, let's see, what was it? Um, they're all um, straight men who want to be women who fuck men because it makes them feel like women, but they really want to fuck women. Um, okay, because, yeah, bisexual people don't exist. Um, when they're cis, so obviously why would they exist when they're trans? His study completely ignores trans men, um, trans masculine behavior, expression, and for that matter, um, there's no hypothesis to explain the three to one gap between trans men and trans women, which is roughly persisted. Um, we could say that's understated because it's a little bit easier to get testosterone and other steroids. Um, 
through the black market than it is estrogen, or maybe it's harder. Um, I, again, I'm not sure, but the usual number we seem to have is three to one. You refuse to consider that this might be a group selective trait coexisting with cis homosexuality. I mean, it's one of those theories that, that could easily be, well, not theories, hypotheses that could easily be explored. You know, I mean, it makes sense that you know, the, the old argument about, oh, well, you know, gayness will just get bred out of the species because, I mean, when's a lesbian ever going to have sex with someone with sperm? Well, you know, maybe if her partner's a girl. Um, and there have been me means of transition um, long before uh, the Industrial Age. There, there were and still are phyto and animal estrogens. Um, there's, there's surgery, you know, that's simple as an orchidectomy. I mean, you know, eunuchs have been around for millennia. Um, you do not evaluate the role that NATO endocrinology may play, specifically the phenomenon of the DES sons and their higher than average incidence of transfemininity. Now, this is one of those things. Um, the children of women who took a synthetic hormone called DES during the 60s and 70s uh, it was banned in, I think, 82 because they found a cervical cancer cluster um, that, that really couldn't be explained any other way other than that all of the women were taking DES. Um, anyway, the, um, the male assigned at birth children um, of DES mothers were way more likely than the general population to... Uh, to be trans in some way, shape, or form, either whether it was cross-dressing or, you know, transition. There were an awful lot of trans girls uh, coming out of moms taking DES during pregnancy. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't explain that because, I mean, there's evidence that contradicts his theory immediately. That maybe there's, you know, some sort of environmental proclivity that does have an effect on the gender identity center in the brain. You refuse to explore other possibilities, such as that, in an, um, other possibilities to autogynophilia, such as that an innately triggered yet not consciously inferred dysphoria, or a late onset of measurable gender dysphoria, could occur because social conditioning is powerful. As John Money accidentally proved, you can raise a boy as a girl, and he'll believe you for a time, unable to quite discover what exactly is wrong. In the absence of positive trans contemporaries and images, this can take an awful lot of time. I, you know, I mean, I, when I was a teenager, did not know trans people existed and you know, that their transitions went well. It was not a thing. It was, they are, you know, freaks, was what I was taught, if it was mentioned at all. Basically, trans people weren't mentioned. I do remember reading an article about the, uh, the boy that John Money tried to reassign female, and yeah. Um, so let's see, where are we? Uh, hence the exponential increase in the incidence of social transition lagging behind would have been quantum leaps in transition technology from the pre-industrial methods of ingesting exogenous phytoestrogens or animal estrogens, or both. Um, and yeah, it's, it's like I just said, um, you know, the technology got better, um, and we saw more people around us, so the cost of transition went down. That's why there's an explosion of trans women. Not, you know, the, everyone got a Victoria's Secret catalog in the 1970s, and therefore, ooh, pretty, must be, you know. Um, as much as I, you know, like that theory, because it would mean we could easily create more girls, but, uh, anywho. You also fail to consider that what you may term autogynophilia is the result of the brain negatively reinforcing sexual imagery that conflicts with the subject's hardwired, uh, hardwired gender identity. Thus, despite the pressure to, you know, like, look, if you are a trans girl, the first thing that happens once you kind of get an inkling is it scares the living shit out of you. For most of you. You know, some of you are really lucky. You went, Mom, I want to be a girl. And problem solved. But for most of us, it's like, oh god, no, no, I can't, I, no, I can't possibly. So you do everything you can to put it out of your mind. And you know, it just doesn't work. Um, and that includes in everyone's fantasy life. You know, uh, 
So despite the pressure to be a cis male, the frequent attempts to perceive uh, herself as male during fantasizing, a trans woman that you term out a gynophile will find herself unable to do so for the same reason most cis women do not and could not if they tried. Yeah, there's a little, there, there's a little thought experiment for any cis woman who reads, you know, just try for, you know, two, three, five years every time you, you know, you're having sex with partner or with yourself or an excellent appliance. Um, you can only picture yourself as a dude. And I'm not talking having a penis. I'm talking, you know, the chest hair, the, the smell, everything. Um, that's not going to work. You're going to, you know, most women are going to be weirded the fuck out. And some of those who aren't are probably men. <laughs> um, yes. So, you failed to do a control study on cis women wherein you asked them to imagine themselves as men during fan sexual fantasies and determine their ability over the long term to accept such a suggestion. Like I said, it's not going to work. Um, it, it just won't. From my limited and subjective perspective, you could have only failed to pursue these avenues of inquiry for one of two reasons. Either intended to, you intended to find only evidence that supported your hypothesis instead of attempting to rule out potential evidence that might not support your theories because you are either emotionally invested in the hypothesis being accepted as fact, or because the subject was sensational, the pressure to publish was too great for you to be able to complete your work. So basically, either, look, you're a fucking sexist or you're sloppy. Um, th there's really no excuse for putting out a work like this, trying to call it groundbreaking, when you haven't looked for any conflicting evidence. All you've got is, is your buddy Blanchard, you know, hooking up tra uh, trans women uh, to a penis stat and then, you know, calling their involuntary erections a, uh, an arousal at, uh, at cross-dressing. You know, it's, guess what? Stress happens. And when stress happens, blood flow increases. And when blood flow increases, uh, physical signs of arousal happen even if someone's not really aroused, even if they're disgusted and horrified by what you're doing. But... You know, I mean, that's just basic biology. Why would you want to let that get in the way of your faux science? I'm also discouraged by the words of your staunchest defender, um, Alice Drager, who says, Why not change minds instead of bodies? I fear that your work will not encourage not acceptance of trans women, but rather a proliferation of the advocacy of reparative therapy for trans women, under the belief that the autogynophiles can be taught to transfer the attraction to self as woman to another woman, and the homosexuals, again, his fucked up terminology, not mine, can be taught to just be twinks and drag queens. Given the current success of reparative therapy uh, strategies, which is near enough to zero to explain most of those positives as a patient who just wants the therapy to end, just wants, you know, to magically make themselves cis, but it doesn't happen, no matter, you know, you can wish really hard, but, you know, wish in one hand, spit in the other, and see which one fills up first. Much like ex-gay therapy, um, you know, that near zero success rate, you know, and that's, that's really bad mission, the longer the term gets, the closer to zero it gets, that's pretty much proof that reparative therapy doesn't work. If being trans is patterning, then reparative therapy should work. You know, just like, oh, if someone believes they're Napoleon, you, you know, eventually they usually can be talked down because it's something they've developed in response to trauma or social pressure or some, you know, deep-seated desire to be a person of importance or wear stupid hats, I'm not sure. Um, that can go away because it's not real. Um, transness, no matter how many people you would, you know, the, uh, the, the festies would try and stick in re-education camps, won't fucking go away. We've tried. We, you know, we've had ample time to try. The standards of care, the, the, you know, the great, uh, the great tranny washout, which is designed to discourage anyone from even fucking considering going through the hazing that is a medically accepted transition. Um, yeah, still, it, it doesn't make the problem go away. You cannot talk someone out of this, um, which is weird, because you can talk people out of a lot of things that aren't innate. 
you can talk people down from suicide. Because, oh, suicide is driven by a feeling of alienation from society, and talking to someone alleviates that alienation, and then all of a sudden the incidence of suicide goes down. You know, why this doesn't happen with trans people, I don't know. It could be fucking innate. I, it's just a hypothesis. I'm looking forward to seeing evidence that proves me wrong other than a nervous boner in a Toronto psychologist's office. Back to you.